Welcome, everybody, uh, to the Saul Stern uh, Lecture uh, for 2018. It is my great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Phil Heyman to join us today on a topic that unfortunately is always topical, but it may be more topical now than uh, even the norm. Uh, must we choose? addressing uh, the conflict between public safety and individual liberty. Um, I'm going to leave it to our Saul Stern professor to introduce our guest today, uh, but I just wanted to tell one story uh, of uh, my personal interactions with Phil, though he may not remember this, uh, had an impact on both thinking and work that I did when I left uh, Harvard. When, uh, when I was up at Harvard, Phil came to some of the sessions that we had on counterterrorism and always had things to say that I found particularly not just interesting but important. And uh, lo and behold, uh, when I left Cambridge, I went to the UN uh, to run the strategy office of the Secretary General. One of the issues I did not expect to be working on was counterterrorism. I had done some counterterrorism work in a U.S. context, but it was not fresh in my uh, kind of uh, my repertoire when I was asked uh, by the Secretary General to chair the UN-wide counterterrorism implementation task force. As we were trying to design a global strategy that we could get every government of the world to endorse, we went through a, what turned out to be a two plus year process of consultation to try to get all the governments of the world to agree on some basic principles and a strategy. And as I was going through that process, I had to stop and think about where is the best representation of the tough issues that we're going to have to tussle with. And I thought about exactly this topic, um, civil liberties um, and the tension with counterterrorism policy. And if you think about the governments of the world, that challenge looks very different depending on what country you're living in and what moment of history you're living through in that country. So I went and dug back in to Phil's books, his thinking, and I even went and found my notes from something that you had said uh, during a lecture. And uh, so for all the professors who think you weren't really heard in your classes and in your lectures, you never know where your stuff is going to show up. But I just want to welcome you, Phil. It's wonderful to have you. Um, it, again, it could not be a more important topic, but also we couldn't have a better speaker to do it. So I'd like to introduce Mac Dessler, our Saul Stern professor, to uh, introduce the lecture and the lecturer. Thank you. Uh, Phil, Phil uh, Hyman graduated from Harvard Law School, he apparently was a pretty good student because his next step was to be a clerk to Supreme Court Justice John Marshall Harlan. I meant to ask him how Harlan had gotten that name at birth, which is a very interesting full name for a Supreme Court Justice. But uh, in any case, uh, Phil has most recently been James Barr Amos Professor of Law, now emeritus at Harvard Law School. His resume includes a number of perches that are very interesting, including uh, Deputy, General, De Deputy Attorney General of the United States, uh, Assistant uh, Secretary of State for Consular Affairs, and other posts. Uh, and he also has written a book on policymaking that Chris Foreman brought up, a, well, a well-worn copy for him to sign because it's been used in several, in the political institutions course. So anyway, uh, Phil is as close to a sort of Renaissance man lawyer as we can have. I'm just delighted that he's here to talk about this uh, issue. Thank you, Mac. Um, 
Actually, I'm going to take you a little bit through a Renaissance uh, type production. I'm going to, uh, it's going to be in four parts, and it'll take about 40 minutes. The first part is, is just a general introduction, a reminder that what the background of uh, Mac's well-chosen title, uh, what lies in the background of Mac's well-chosen title. Then I'm going to turn to what's the problem of terrorism that the United States institutions are dealing with, and what are the possible ways of dealing with it? There are very few, and that's going to push us on the civil liberty side because it isn't as if there are lots of openings for civil liberties respecting forms of protection of the national security that, we are, that we're facing. Small groups uh, supported by foreign organizations, sometimes by foreign governments, uh, prepared to engage uh, recruiting in the United States, arming and developing colleagues in the United States, and then mounting an attack. It's in many ways very similar to uh, the events when it's not terrorism, such as a, a school shooting. How do you defend against those things? So that's part two. Part three is, how did the Supreme Court open the gates to all, so, all forms of surveillance, to a new world of surveillance? Because it did open the gates. They weren't open. I'm, I'm, I, uh, intend to tell you very carefully, but if I, uh, if I confuse you on something, just sort of wave your hand. I intend to tell you that the four, what the Fourth Amendment says, how it's worked very well for a long time, how the Supreme Court decided to reorganize it in uh, 1968, and how by the time uh, 50, we're now 50 years later, exactly 50 years later, it had created a large problem of civil liberties. Just an immense amount of information available to this president and the next president and the one after that. And then finally, I'm going to give you a surprisingly direct answer to Max's question, uh, must, we must we choose between civil liberties and domestic security? So those are the four stages. First, the, the background. The Bill of Rights is the first eight amendments to the Constitution, and what they do is they forbid government officials, federal government officials, and generally now state government officials, from taking certain steps that the writers of the Constitution, basically not the writers, basically the generation or the people that came right after them, thought that government officials might want to take and that would be very dangerous for the, for the political security of the country. Uh, just as a reminder, the first eight include freedom of speech. In the first one, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press. They were very worried that uh, the next president, who was George Washington, I, I don't know how they could have worried about George Washington, but they were worried that presidents to come would try to control the country by abridging free speech, free press, free assembly. Uh, the second one is, of course, the right to bear arms, uh, much disputed as to what people feared uh, uh, but at the moment, a major constitutional provision. Uh, the third, nobody remembers. The fourth is the one I'll be talking about most. And that's the uh, right of people to keep private places, to, put, to keep private documents. Actually, it's places, documents, and uh, and information, communications. Communications, places, and documents. The right of people to keep those private and uh, 
the, they set up a very simple, very good system that ran well until 1968. And then in 1968, they changed it all for good motivations. And all of a sudden, I, I have a little bit that I wanted to read to you. The next president will know a great deal about, unless we're careful, will know a great deal about everyone's thoughts, fears, friends, communications, uh, prior history. I could go on and on. All of that is going to be available unless changes, uh, unless there are changes. Okay. Now, uh, it shouldn't be, a, my first point, and this is all, the only one I wanted to make at this stage, is that it shouldn't be a surprise that uh, there's a conflict, the conflict that the title points out between public safety and individual liberty. The Bill of Rights, which is the source of most of our civil liberties, or at least an important part of our civil liberties protection, is designed to deal with the threat of an overpowering government. That's exactly what each of the eight amendments is about, eight First Amendments to the Constitution. Times of danger are times when the public wants a very powerful government, or putting it more directly, in times of danger, the public and the Congress are not enthusiastic about rules that inhibit and, and deny the federal government the right to do whatever it wants, the president in particular, to do whatever he wants. Amendments that were written to deny the president powers for fear that he would use them for political purposes suddenly become uh, boundaries, fences, around steps that the president may feel he has to take to protect us against enemies. In the case we're going to be talking about, it's going to be uh, home, homegrown terrorists working with ISIS or uh, Al-Qaeda or somebody else. OK. The conflict is, was built there in 1791 when People insisted on a Bill of Rights. And the real question that Mac has asked is, are we going to uh, find a moderately sensible and controlled and calm answer to the conflict that they built in then? All right, let me take you to the second subject. Uh, what we can do about a particular type of terrorism Terrorism committed by a single individual or small group uh, living in the United States with, a, uh, with an assistance in general from private or government groups from abroad. It could be ISIS, it could be the Soviet Union, it could be Turkey, it could be anybody. Uh, now, in that situation, what are the, very, what are the possibilities? Because my argument to you here is that the possibilities are very few. It's all a matter of geography. What we would like to do is keep the members of that group away from the target or away from the weapons they need to blow up the target or to attack the target or away from the allies they need to mount a bigger attack. Uh, September 11, 2001 was a huge attack, uh, 100 times greater than anything we had seen before. OK, what can you do? One thing you can do is you can, and th these are the choices the government has. I've worked on them for a long time in the government. I now work on them. Uh, in a half academic, half policy way with the, with the group from the FBI. 
Okay. Uh, the first thing you could do is you could simply, oh, I'm afraid I have to immediately introduce the Fourth Amendment. I was going to try and save it from, save it from you, save you from it for a little while. The Fourth Amendment just says two things. It says, if you want to, uh, well, I'm going to, it's two by two. I'm going to have to say four. If you want to detain somebody, arrest somebody, lock somebody up, you have to show a judge, that's a very important part of it, that you have good reason, technically called probable cause, to believe that person has committed a crime for which he can and should be locked up. The other half of it is a search. It deals with both detention and search. And the search part says, if you want to search private places for records or phone calls, communications, or for uh, the, of what, to find out what's in a particular place, the government has to show a judge, it's exactly the same judge, it's a lower federal judge, has to show a judge that it has reason to believe that evidence of a crime will be found from the search. It's very simple. You have to show, basically, you have to show a judge under the Fourth Amendment that you have good reason to be invading privacy in order to find what you know is evidence, or you have good reason to arrest somebody in order to uh, convict them of having committed a crime. Okay. Uh, the first thing you might think of doing, uh, I'm going to be interested if you have additional ideas, I can only think of about seven things the government can do. Uh, there have been times, particularly you all probably know about the, uh, the detention of the Japanese Americans, they were citizens during the Second World War, on the West Coast, locked up in camps for fear that they would join the Japanese in an attack on us. Uh, if you could detain anybody who might be uh, a would-be terrorist, you're going to keep the detention, the bars around him will keep him away from the target. Of the Western nations, only Britain and Australia have a law that permits detention on public policy grounds, safety grounds, without showing a judge that the person uh, has committed a crime, a crime that was written in a statute book. Uh, both Britain and Australia use it very rarely. Maybe Britain, I think, has five or six or seven people in detention. It just means that without complying with our Fourth Amendment, without complying with a rule that you have to show that the person is properly to be arrested or has evidence in a place where, it, in a hidden place that you've been told it's in, uh, instead of that, you can simply detain the person without the constitutional provision to protect that civil liberty, that very important civil liberty, you would not have, uh, you would not have difficulty preventing anybody you can identify as a would-be terrorist from committing a crime. You can do the same thing basically by denying him weapons, denying him comrades, denying him access, and it's uh, frequently a woman too, denying her access to the target. Um, anything that restricts the freedom of movement or the possible equipping of a terrorist and is safe in doing it, a person in a cell, it's very safe. Anything that does that would protect us against that person engaging in domestic terrorism. What we actually have done in the last years, and I think it's, like most of the things here, fairly reasonable, what we've actually done is found people who were spouting out 
their hatred of the United States, their hatred of its citizens, the hatred of the government, their desire for revenge. I don't think in the United States we have too many of those people. The FBI has a list of about 2,000. I don't know if they really have 2,000s, but they have a list of 2,000. Uh, nothing happens to them. They're just on a list. I don't, I've never seen it. I don't want to see it in the, in the FBI. Okay. Uh, the United States has a deep tradition against detaining Americans. After the Japanese Americans were detained in the Second World War, Congress passed a statute, I think it was 10 or 20 years later, saying that we would never do that again to an American citizen without the consent of the whole Congress. And uh, it's a very, very important protection. If you can pick people off the street, put them in jail, uh, they're like unlikely to be dissenters, they're unlikely to disapprove of the government, and that's the world of uh, the, the, of Turkey, of Russia, of China. Okay. Uh, what we've done is we have found people who were talking like that, and what is missing to be able to arrest them is they have to have taken some action to carry out the words. They have a freedom of speech, back to the Bill of Rights, right, to uh, fume at the government and to threaten the government. What they can't do is they can't uh, make speech that immediately threatens a terrorist attack, but they don't do that. They just talk about how awful it is and how, we're gonna, how they're gonna get even. Okay, what we're missing is something that shows that they're serious about it, that they're not just, uh, that they're not just blowing air. And that would be buying, buying explosives, uh, watching on uh, the internet how to make a bomb programs from ISIS, uh, asking two or three comrades to work with you. All of those things would turn free speech into a crime of attempt. It would be a, an attempt or a conspiracy to engage in terrorism. And then they could be arrested and they would be, have to be tried, et cetera, et cetera. Bill of Rights has an elaborate set of rules about how people can be tried and when they have to be tried. Lacking those other indications of seriousness, what uh, the United States has done is we we meaning the federal government, not me, not you, but me in the federal government, uh, will send in to someone who's talking about how he wants to blow up the Sears Tower in Chicago. We'll send in someone who uh, does a good imitation of being uh, a very similar character to the person who's threatening and says, you've been doing an awful lot of talking Let's go do it. I've got a car right out front here, and it has in it explosives, and it has a map of the Sears Tower, and let's just go up and do it. And they'll show you the white powder that's the explosive. It isn't an explosive, but they think it's an explosive. And in about, I would guess, 250 cases, the person who was uh, explaining his hatred and sense of despair before the government will get in the car, head off to Chicago, watch the FBI agent who's purporting to be an ISIS member, run in with talcum powder, spread it everywhere, light a match and throw the match, and then when the guy says good, they arrest him for attempt. The trouble with that is it's a very costly way, both for the individual who is often a, a want to be terrorists, these want to be anything, uh, and who may end up spending 20 years in jail. And for the government, too, it costs us $60,000 a year to keep them in jail uh, for, 20, for each of 20 years. Okay, what else can you do? 
to, now we're in the category, we're in the subcategory of making, uh, disarming a person from the ability to uh, commit an attack, keeping them safe that way. After all, that's what they're really trying to do. They're trying to prevent uh, terrorist attacks. The uh, Britain and uh, a few other countries have something they call control orders. When the guy starts talking in a wild way about dangerous things he may do, uh, they call him before a judge, and the judge issues an order that he shall not go anywhere near the Sears Tower, he's not allowed to buy an automatic weapon, he's not allowed to buy explosives or buy firecrackers, that's Boston Marathon was blown up with firecrackers, uh, with the powder from firecrackers. Uh, and the judge's order, in a sense, builds a cell around the suspect. He's not in a cell, but anything he does that could be dangerous will be uh, the subject of arrest and, and conviction and also could justify a search. Uh, Britain does very few of those. They haven't proved to be very useful. I forget whether it's New Zealand or, or, or who does the same, has the same practice and they don't turn out to be very useful. When you think about it, all they do is they make it a little bit easier for the, the control orders not, not the undercover operation, the control orders, just make it a little bit easier for the government to have an excuse to, for arresting a person. He would, you were told you shouldn't go near uh, the Sears Tower in Chicago. And we found, and a policeman found you there. A policeman just picks up, somebody's wandering around, checks his identification, calls it into Washington. Washington calls back within a very short period of time and says there's a control order telling this guy he shouldn't be there. And then they arrest him for that. It just makes it easier for the police. Okay, there's a last thing that's new that I'm gonna come back to in section four. And that is, this is all in keeping the individual away from the crime. You could, by the way, if you wanted, if you, if you were able to, you could simply guard the target. You could just keep him away from the target. There are two problems with that. One is he could fire a, a bazooka from uh, 300 yards away and blow up the target. And you, you wouldn't, it'd be very hard to keep him from being 300 yards away. Uh, the other difficulty is he's, uh, uh, the, the other difficulty is when he's in, uh, he's, He's too close to succeeding when you're likely to be going after him then. You really have to, you really want to prevent him. Uh, oh, let me put it, let me put it much more vividly. There, the government distinguishes between soft targets and hard targets. A hard target is one that is likely to have guards around it is likely to have people with guns inside, is likely to have people checking passes as you come in. A soft target is one that doesn't have any of those protections. Terrorists have recently been going after mainly soft targets. School, uh, school bombers aren't terrorists, but they go after very soft targets, uh, youngsters in school. Uh, the you, uh, the Las Vegas attack, which had, I don't know, 80 people killed, very soft target, uh, also done with a bazooka-style attack from a great distance. Um, we have, to, our, our country is full of soft targets. We're, stand, we're sitting in a soft target now. No, no protection around here. Uh, and any school, any football game, any, any indoor sport, any library is a soft target. 
uh, we come from, and I come from Belmont in Massachusetts. Three weeks ago, somebody half crazy went into the next little town's library and stabbed to death an older woman who was sitting at a reading desk. That's a very soft target. There's nobody there to stop them. So, uh, with, there are too many targets to, to, to guard them all. If you could guard the target, it would be all right. But you have to keep your eye on the individual as he heads towards the target. There are just too many targets to have all of them made safe by guards in the United States. Literally thousands and thousands of targets. All right. The second, there's only one other thing you really can, oh, I'm sorry, I started to tell you, there's something new they're trying, and that is instead of sending, instead of coaxing an individual, it's not quite coaxing, almost coaxing an individual into trying to blow up the Sears Tower with talcum powder, and then arresting him for 25 years, if you can catch him doing anything if the person you're worried about, you can catch doing anything illegal. Uh, the government is starting to explore something like probation or parole in advance. They'll go up in some places, they're starting at most in Brooklyn, they'll go up to the individual, and, and it's just the beginning, and they'll say to them, uh, we found you committing this crime but the government, it's almost always the FBI if they're worried about a terrorist, the government is prepared to uh, forget about it if you sign, if you agree to engage in a program with us. The program will require, and they, they're given all this in paper, a, uh, it'll require the person to uh, meet, to have a mentor who he, I'm gonna make it a he, who he will meet with several times, uh, several times a month, to have uh, a, a person or a location, maybe a government official who he checks in with on the security side and reassures him that he's not, he's not uh, let, me just, let me just make sure I'm being clear enough. This is a person that the government suspects of wanting to commit a terrorist act, but can convict only of something else. Not quite throwing, not quite littering, but something else. He went in to check out the building when they didn't have permission. Possible penalty, two years. And they will say to him, we'll forget about the two years if you will sign on to a program, and you have to keep the terms of the program for two years, and if you don't, we'll arrest you and you'll be tried. Uh, the idea is that you can start to change the person's character. You can start to give him a job. You can put him in contact with other people who have been terrorists and didn't like the outcome. Uh, you can do all sorts of things as part of a program much more cheaply than you can keep them in prison at 60 or $65,000 a year. Very interesting idea. The other part of it is if you don't do something like that, you're likely to anger a lot of friends of the individual you've just arrested or you're trying to arrest. It's a way of showing that you're not, uh, that you want to be friendly to the group from whom you've just arrested a person. If it's a, if it's a Muslim group, we want to be friendly with the Muslim popula population. All right. I think I better, uh, uh, that's the first thing you can do. The second thing you can do, and the only other thing, is you can, uh, you can develop a system of surveillance that has the suspect, if you've identified somebody as a suspect, constantly in view. Now, in, we're gonna talk about what happens with in view. In view, it's gonna to get to be a huge capacity for the government. 
but you can watch him all the time. And when, and when he gets close to the target, you can then quickly protect the target, if you want to think about it that way. Uh, or you, and when he gets close to the target, you can say, you know, all those speeches you made about how you hated the United States, now you're wandering around a target with a box of talcum powder. Uh, we think you can be arrested now. You know, you've done enough to satisfy the Constitution that there was probable cause to believe you've committed a crime. It would be the crime of attempted bombing, something like that. Okay, let's switch to the, to the second half of what the government can do. It can engage in surveillance in a variety of ways. At, on every one of the terrorist events in the recent, I, I can't swear it's every one, but in most of them over the last two years, a person committing a terrorist attack in Paris, in Brussels, in London, in uh, California, in Florida, has, uh, 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 has been identified by the government as somebody who might very well be contemplating a terrorist act in advance. What happens is they act, they set off an explosion, people are killed, the police are asked, or the, or the or Scotland Yard is asked, or the French gendarmes are asked, did, did you have any reason to suspect this guy? And they respond, yes, uh, he was on our watch list. The watch list isn't really what you think it is, but he's on our, he's on our watch list. And then the press asks, I'm taking it from the very sympathetic position of public relations if you're in a police agency. And then they ask, well, if he was on a watch list, why weren't you watching him when he went in and set off a bomb? And the police always respond, including our FBI. It takes too many people to watch somebody. Uh, it, they figure it takes about 25 or 30 people to watch, pe watch somebody for a weekend. And we don't have enough people. They, you know, we have a lot of police, but we don't have nearly enough. That 2,000 figure I mentioned, that this number of people we think may be dangerous in the United States, we can't put 2,000 times 25 on them for any sustained period of time on each of them. Okay, what's the answer to that? The answer is you have to move to other forms of surveillance, not a foot patrol of 25 people hiding behind telephone poles, but a drone overhead, a uh, face recognition camera that will tell you uh, where it has seen that face re recently. Has it seen it at Sears Tower? Uh, New York has thousands of those cameras. London has five for every one that New York has. Uh, the, uh, wh what else can you do? You can use uh, in informants. You can get somebody to be his buddy. It's a little bit like an undercover operation telling them, let's go and set off the, the bomb. But you can simply uh, surveil them by talking to them, by establishing a false friendship. I had here a quick list of the things you could do. And uh, I guess I'll get to them when we move on to the next subject, which is what happened to the Fourth Amendment when we developed all those things you could do. Okay, uh, you can do, you can use big data techniques to determine, uh, you, to determine what people general, people who are terrorists, we don't have enough of them to do this very well, what people who are terrorists do in preparation for a terrorist attack. And then identify whether this person is pursuing uh, the plans that a good terrorist would pursue. There's a, there's a lot of lot of things you can do to surveil a person now in the United States. I'm gonna tell you why that doesn't invade his privacy under the Fourth Amendment. Okay. Um, think now of uh, the question that Mac gave me, must we choose 
Well, we don't have much choice if we reasonably suspect somebody is going to try a terrorist act. We, our real choices are to uh, get rid of a very desirable tradition of not allowing an arrest or a search unless there's, the judge is satisfied that you have probable cause to believe that that's justified. Uh, or uh, getting rid of a very desirable, well, maybe it's the same point, tradition of not detaining citizens. We did, of course, detain a thousand people in Guantanamo who were not citizens. Not detaining citizens without uh, Congress having agreed that you can detain them without going to a judge. Uh, the, uh, there are not a lot of things you can do. You, would, you very quickly, if you, I don't want to do it again and you don't want me to do it again, but you very quickly go through the list of things that I've mentioned and you end up with surveillance. Uh, you end up with modern technology because what you've got, to, you've got to find a way of surveilling that is much cheaper than 25 cops on the street. You look for uh, a way of surveilling that is going to be cheap and effective. Uh, how about every time somebody buys an automatic weapon? They have to get the permission of the government. They have to get a license from the government. Why don't we match that list with the two thousand with a list of two thousand people suspected of being terrorists? I think that would be a very good idea. And you would come up with a list of instead of two thousand, you'd come up with a list of uh, seventy-five, who were not only ranting about wanting to blow up the United States, but also buying automatic an automatic weapon that could kill everybody in this room. In, in 15 seconds, almost literally in 15 seconds. Okay, now, if we're gonna go heavily, uh, we're stuck going heavily on surveillance. If we're gonna go heavily on surveillance, how do you get around the Fourth Amendment? That, how do you get around people's right to privacy? Well, this one, I just have to take you a little bit into the law. Uh, in 1968, exactly 50 years ago, the Supreme Court had a case of a guy who was a gambler, illegal gambler, who would go in a cell phone, and we go in a in a uh, in, in a telephone booth. If you ask the younger people, have they ever seen a telephone booth? you'll find that it's a very rare thing to see a telephone booth. But at that time, he went in the telephone booth, and he was going to talk about his illegal gambling. And the FBI had a little suction cup attached to uh, a little tape recorder. And it uh, stuck the suction cup on the top of the glass telephone booth and listened to everything he said. OK. It, the Supreme Court was stuck with the idea that that must be a violation of privacy. And he, he, what did he think, they said, when he went into a glass booth? Didn't, they, didn't he think that he was being promised privacy of some sort? And the answer is yes, but it required them to depart from a very old tradition under the Fourth Amendment, which is to violate the Fourth Amendment, and in general to violate privacy laws, you had to go on somebody else's property. You, you had to go on, you, you had to be invading the property rights of somebody else. Well, putting a suction cup on top of a phone booth, which is the way law develops, was not creating, was not invading either the property of the phone company or the property of Mr. Katz. And so they wrote a new rule and they said, we no longer believe that you have to commit a trespass. This was after 150 years of having to go onto somebody else's property. We no, longer, we no longer believe that. You just have to violate his reasonable expectation of privacy. So, now that was a wide open term. 
what's a reasonable expectation of privacy? The courts fought with that term, trying to figure out what it meant for a long time, but only one thing seemed perfectly clear. What was perfectly clear was that what you knowingly expose to the public or to a large part of the public was not, you, was not something as to which you had a reasonable expectation of privacy. If you exposed it to the public, you were exposing it to the public. If you knew you were doing that, then that was not an area that was protected. They were going to protect all areas where someone had a reasonable expectation of privacy. And, and as they staggered around trying to figure out what was a reasonable expectation of privacy, they fastened on the notion that a reasonable expectation of privacy excludes anything you knowingly expose to the public. Well, it's not bad, except that it turns out that with modern technology, almost everything you do is knowingly exposed to the public. And so none of it is protected by search anymore. If the government, which it, which it does sometimes, flies a helicopter over your property to look in the windows, uh, you certainly knew that helicopters could fly there. So whatever you had inside the window, what you had uh, knowingly exposed and therefore to the public and therefore did not have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Uh, you could do the same, uh, another, uh, uh, if you, the biggest one of all is if a company with whom you did business, make, make it a little company like Amazon, if a company with which you did business made records of when they sold you something, you had exposed all the information about what you'd bought and what your credit card number was and everything else to the company knowingly. So you could hardly expect, I, I can hardly say these words because I, I could expect the contrary. You could hardly expect that there would be no, uh, that you would hardly expect that there would be privacy if the government came up, went up to Amazon and said, I'd like to have all the, uh, I'd, I'd like to have all the records you have on Dean Orr. Uh, that could, he certainly exposed it himself. Um, what else? I've got them all here. Uh, okay. Here are the things that were automatically and exposed to other people and therefore automatically not a search. That means that the government had no restrictions as to all the following. Informants, that guy I sent off to talk about uh, where, we'll, where we'll go for the Sears Tower. Undercover operations, very much like informants. Um, plain view from a place open to the public. How far do you think we can see with sophisticated lenses from a, from a airplane or a drone? Uh, miles and miles and miles. Um, you expose that any, if I'm, I am right this minute exposing this page to anybody with a uh, powerful enough lens. Uh, consent. Uh, these are, these turn out to be the actual cases. They, uh, you, the p police want to know whether you had marijuana in your house. So they walk up with a marijuana smelling dog, uh, ring the doorbell and say, I'm selling tickets to the policeman's ball. The dog goes, woof, <laughs> and you're in jail. Okay. Uh, you knowingly expose the inside, the smells inside the house. Um, okay. Anything that has been subpoenaed by a grand jury, President Trump, better be careful. Um, search is incident to an arrest. If, you're, I'm, if I'm carrying a cell phone and I'm arrested for spitting on the street, they can search the whole cell phone. 
Uh, okay. Now, something else had to happen, and then there was no protection. What else had to happen is we had to have a techno we had to have a technolo technological breakthrough that allowed a vast expansion of what could be seen, heard, smelled, tasted, I'm missing one of them, felt. Uh, in other words, a great, a sudden, huge technolo technological advances in what could be picked up, uh, what could be stored on a thumbnail, uh, what could be organized to figure out Oh, I mean, we, we demanded the phone numbers of everybody, that everybody in the United States was, had called or been called on uh, because uh, that would help us identify who might be in a gang, in a terrorist gang together. Uh, again, you gave the phone numbers to the phone company and they would just turn them over. Okay, you, you get the picture. What's happening is suddenly uh, Google and Facebook are finding it very financially advantageous to develop as much information as they can about each of their customers. And they write it down and they store it for their purpose, for their own purposes, so that they can then advertise to that customer. Then the government comes in and had the power to simply say, uh, we, we would like to see everything that you have on max purchases. And uh, if you're afraid they might, the government might have to do a lot of work included in the records are uh, the analysis by Google, highly sophisticated of what we know about, uh, what we know about Mac. And so uh, what we can uh, in, in other words, what the government will then, the government will then know everything Google knows, and the best thought is that Google knows everything about you right this minute. Knows everything about you. All right. When you come, so, a very, short, a very quick summary, because I've gone much too long. One, the, uh, along came I, the, the Supreme Court blundered into the notion that anything anybody made public was not entitled to the protections of the Constitution or of statutes. And number two, simultaneously, every, I call these no-search areas. They, everything that, is, that you make public in one of these ways is no longer protected. And then along came the most sophisticated of internet, computer, uh, satellite, the most sophisticated of uh, information gathering and processing and storing, which, they, which the government simply hooked onto those no, those no search. Think of the drone that used to fly over and Somebody would look down and they'd either see something that was suspicious or not see something that was suspicious. Now it's all recorded. The drone can stay in the air over a particular place for not for seconds or minutes, but for a half an hour or a half a day. Suddenly technology was used to fill in the openings that the Supreme Court had created in the Katz case 50 years ago. A combination of being able to seize anything that fell into one of these no search categories and a new capacity to seize, seize, store computer capacities created a vast amount of information. Um, I would, okay, I'm going to the last point. Uh, when I thought about it, I wrote in an article, whoever becomes president in the decades ahead may inherit extensive institutional knowledge 
about almost every citizen's beliefs, concerns, ambitions, interests, fears, actions, intentions, and associates. There's no nothing left from that list. I mean, you, that list is a pretty complete list. All right, time to answer Max's question. Is it, uh, must, must we choose, and is the conflict in, over in favor of the gov and resolved in favor of the government, the conflict between public safety and individual liberty? The surprising, my surprising conclusion is that um, there's, that we're rebounding. Maybe I shouldn't be, maybe I shouldn't be surprised that the country is bouncing back. That uh, we, you know, in the course of the last 15 years, we tortured, we, oftentimes foreigners, always foreigners. We detained people without uh, trial. We uh, did everything that was contrary to our traditions and often contrary to our laws. But suddenly it's collapsed. The government doesn't like that so much anymore. I, at one point I went and saw, I made an appointment and went and saw the director of the CIA and the director of the FBI and said, uh, do you really want to be torturing people? Do you really want to be waterboarding people? Uh, it makes your agency a place that nobody wants to work. It makes the, uh, it makes you look like thugs instead of clever foreign agents or clever FBI agents. Uh, why do you, you, we know of nothing that you're gaining from it and there was no record that we were developing anything from it. Do you really want to do that? And one, the first, first, the director of the CIA, uh, Panetta, said, uh, I think you've got a good point. Why don't you ask Mueller if he agrees? And I went over and I asked Mueller, who was then director of the FBI, and he said, yeah, I, of course I agree. And we stopped torturing people. We've, uh, Abu Ghraib had a great deal to do with it. All we had to have is one Abu Ghraib with sexual humiliation as the policy of the United States military, and the military bailed out. Uh, we've started to ask, what we have to do is we have to ask questions. It, is this step that will interfere with civil liberties or security about civil liberties really necessary? Couldn't we do it a different way, or couldn't we do without that information, or why do we think the information we're getting will be helpful? That question generally ends up with not wanting to do it, not wanting to, uh, in, in fact, do something that's very unpopular. The country's bouncing back. It's, it, it's becoming, it all, of course, that would happen automatically when the fear, fear level went down. But in general, uh, there's a shift and a shift that's extremely healthy, and it's one over time. And it's one that we've seen before, after the Second World War, after the First World War, uh, after the Mexican-American War, after the Civil War. The country seems to have a resilience about civil liberties and a willingness to do without them when it's in fear, but an insistence to come back when it's out of fear. And we're in much less fearful times. I wouldn't swear what would happen if only through torture we could prevent another uh, World Trade Center attack. The president would probably order torture or whatever. But short of that, these things have become unpopular. We sort of value our traditions and departing from them, uh, making Abu Ghraib the symbol of the United States around the world is not something people like doing. My own guess is that we're going to survive this, and civil liberties will survive it at the same time. And I better quit. Thank you.
Um. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Um, I mean, as you were talking, I was thinking, well, why don't we say that uh, the only time that something is classified as terrorism is if it's provoked by somebody outside the United States and there's a direct involvement. And, uh, but if it's just internally, and it's just from reading things on the internet and so forth, um, why don't we just say this person is mentally ill and uh, treat them in the same category as we're going to treat this Florida shooter and say, you know, people have lots of reasons for erupting in violence and to, you know, try to, when it's in entirely internal to the United States, to try to make a distinction and say, well, this is terrorism and that is not, is a rather slippery or strange line to draw. Um, by the way, it's, it, it gives the government great troubles. Your suggestion uh, is tracks troubles the government has. There is no crime of domestic terrorism. We couldn't, uh, we could arrest the guy for arson, my, my guy who's trying to blow up the uh, Sears Tower, but there's no, there's a plenty of crimes of foreign terrorism. There's no crime of domestic terrorism. The FBI doesn't like even calling it domestic terrorism. Uh, they call it uh, homegrown terrorism. It, it's not, it, it, it's a, it evokes a different picture. It involves a, invokes a picture of somebody like the Florida guy who was slowly and steadily getting very close to crazy. Somebody who was going to be in big trouble and you could see he was going to be in big trouble. They may have many of the same people handling the two categories. But they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't call the Florida guy a terrorist. Ter um, I, you know, I, it's a little bit, there, there's immense similarities between, oh shoot. I, 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 yeah, even, even the Florida guy, what's his name again, who, uh, I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting. Cruz, yeah. Even Cruz, there's immense similarities. They, let, me, let me just track them for you. They start off with somebody who feels neglected and ignored by people he values. If it's foreign terrorism, it's going to often be because he's a Muslim or because he's something else, and, and that deprives him of, of respect at home. He's going to uh, be encouraged by a group, and the group does. And we have terror. We've had what we call terrorist groups in the West and a number of places. So it doesn't have to be a foreigner. It could be domestic. We then have to discover that he's really threatening something. You know, not immediate. If it was immediate, we could arrest him for it. But he's threatening something. Uh, we discover that in the same way for both of them. Uh, nearby relatives, friends report it. Think of, uh, think of the guy in Florida. He was reported 30, 40 times. Or we find him buying that gun that I think ought to be automatically uh, the subject of a, uh, either a terrorist file or something else. Domestic terrorism is in the U.S. Code but it simply is a procedural provision. If you're going to try somebody, I forget what it says, but it's not a crime, domestic terrorism. It's sort of tracking your way, your thought on this. I don't think we make much mischief by treating them both as terrorism, and we do have the advantage of uh, coming to recognize that people like uh, Cruz, like Cruz in Florida, are being bred in the United States and they're just as dangerous. You know, and we have to start worrying about them earlier. We have to surveil them earlier, all those things. 
but I, I don't have any feeling. That, I don't have any feeling that you're wrong. We are, we're always on the border of that line. Oh, Matt. Phil, you uh, suggested that modern You suggested that modern surveillance was an answer to the problem of numbers, and uh, because uh, you could do things mechanically that would, could be done by, say, 25 individuals. But assuming you do lots of surveillance. And it, uh, I mean, there are 300 million plus people in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, who is going to? Don't you have the same problem in the sense of unless you know who you're surveilling? Uh, uh, that, to yeah. who is going to be? Uh, who would is going to read this information? I mean, the NSA would, has lots of international would, would you, communications. I, I just need one more hour to say all the things that I forgot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> One of the, the, the worst thing that happened when the Supreme Court said we no longer are looking for trespass, we now have <clears throat> reasonable expectation of privacy and nobody reasonably expects privacy about anything they've made public. There, the worst thing that happened is the Supreme Court decided not only that you didn't have to have probable cause to, to go in private places looking for private things or for private activities. Uh, but also that uh, you, uh, if, if you were, uh, if, if you did feel you had to search, I, I would put, I'd rec this would be something less than probable cause. A court should have to say yes. Now, a court, there's no way you're going to get the courts of the United States to say yes 300 million times in any, in any of our lifetimes. But they said they got rid of their two requirements in the Fourth Amendment. One is a judicial decision that there's probable cause to believe good reason for a search. They took away the, the requirement that a court decide it. You're right that... Uh, if you just took, if you took that away and just left that somebody has to feel there's probable cause to think that there's evidence in a place, uh, the government would be searching much too much, and uh, it wouldn't be, and most of the time it wouldn't be finding anything. What it, uh, let me tell you just what the government has done. Uh, I, I, one of my reasons for being optimistic is the Supreme Court is backing down fast on what I was criticizing. The Supreme Court has started to say that uh, for you to have a, a, for the government to say that you have uh, waived your privacy rights by uh, putting, your, putting information in a place where it could be seen, where you know it could be seen, uh, the Supreme Court has said, well, you know, those safe places where you don't have to get a warrant are only going to be places where ordinary people can get with ordinary equipment. They're much better definition. In other words, that we're only going to allow the government to spy on, on you, Mac, if they uh, if where they're spying from is a place that ordinary people can get to, and that means ordinary people don't have helicopters, they don't have expensive lenses, they, we now can go, we, we can now go through the walls, we can see through the walls of a house. Ordinary people can't see through the walls of a house. The Supreme Court is shifting from saying the individual's reasonable expectation of privacy to saying the, the individual had to expect that ordinary people with, with equipment they could afford could have been seen what you exposed. That makes a lot, that makes a lot of difference. And that, that you, there you have no, you have no privacy in it. Yes. So I was actually just about to ask you about um, Kylo versus the U.S. Um, and I want to know, uh, do you think it goes far enough? Um, because, you know, it's probably not going to be very long until 
a person's ability to look inside a house isn't severely limited by technology. You could even make the argument that you could buy thermal imaging equipment now that would would allow a normal person to avoid that statute. Yeah, as a matter of fact, it's what you're saying is uh, quite predictable after you said it. When you when you said whether people are people do have to worry that with the new rule that uh, the new rule that says only if ordinary people could have only if you put something in a place where ordinary people could have seen it, have you given up your right to privacy. And the fact of the matter is ordinary people are going to be able to see more and more over time. Te technology is going to come back and bite. It's going to give ordinary people, it's going to give ordinary people the opportunity to see things which when with that opportunity they will have you will have given up your right to privacy. I mean it, it will technology is setting sort of setting boundaries on what can be done, and technology is changing very quickly. Yes? Uh, you talked about the Bill of Rights being uh, put together to constrain the state from uh, persecuting the population. But now we have reached a stage where corporations are able, in fact, to accumulate vast amounts of information on us. And uh, the government can, tries to get that information sometimes. The corporations resist. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me there's a new actor on the scene. Uh, I've noticed that the Europeans are, seem to be much more conscious of this than the Americans. So I was wondering what you think about this new actor on the stage. Mm -hmm. Sort of big, big businesses. Yeah, I mean Google, Apple, yeah. uh, Amazon, etc. Yeah. Europeans worry much more about the private actors than about the government actors. We worry much more about government actors than the private actors. And that, that that's perfectly true. Uh, what will... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, getting the first part of your question. Well, just, I mean, I, I was wanting you to, to assist oh, you know, what role the private act has now played in the city, because it was discussed all before as the state versus the, the people. And now it's the corporation, maybe, versus the people. Well, you, you can always, Congress can always pass a law if it doesn't mind being disfunded by the by the corporations <laughs> that said that corporations can't use this information in certain ways. But, the, but we're stuck with the Constitution. Was, uh, Bill of Rights was written in 1791, and it says to government, you know, the Congress shall make no law respecting the freedom of speech. It just says the Congress. The Supreme Court on its own applied all those rules to state governments as well as the federal government. Just said, just said it, that's it. Uh, but you couldn't quite apply them to corporations. And if corporations get as powerful as governments, uh, we're going to miss it. They, you know, they, basically, the people who wrote the Constitution, first of all, probably didn't, weren't aware that there was going to be a corporate form of management. And um, if they had been aware, they would think it highly unlikely to be as dangerous as King George. But that's going to come, that will come back to harm us. Because all this, the vast amount of information that's being gathered, and the processing that will tell you exactly what you think, what you like, what you buy, uh, what you just bought, all of that uh, is being done by private businesses who can do much better if they know the preferences of their customers and of their suppliers than if they don't. And so it, they accumulate that. Yes, Jeff. So the way you were talking about you know, basically both privacy and the things that somebody would need to engage in an act of terrorism both assumed that it was very physical, that they were 
physically private places, your house, you could you know, physical communications that would be in the house. The wannabe terrorists would have to physically get access to people and materials and get access to the target. How does that change when you're dealing with extraordinarily powerful information technologies? Um, well, some of it, uh, you can, uh, ISIS will teach you or me how to make a bomb uh, if you just tune into their uh, website. So a lot of it becomes public information through uh, electronic media. Uh, the, uh, ISIS can also, uh, ISIS also recruits from, uh, from the population by using the internet. And it can provide weapons, you know, if it can communicate with you, it can tell you how to get weapons or where to get weapons. I don't, um, Uh, what, uh, it, it isn't, it, it, I mean, your question seemed to suggest that maybe electronically, but maybe through uh, the marvels of technology, you could do great damage without having the difficulty of buying weapons. I think, you, I think with cyber, certain types of cyber operations, you could. Yeah. I, well, you can certainly you can certainly shut down a large corporation. You can certainly blackmail a large corporation, shut shut it down, shut its computers down unless it does something. There's a lot of blackmail by computer. Uh, the thing that worries me the most is uh, this is all this is all of geography. They're trying to keep a person who wants to do us harm away from a somewhat randomly chosen target, so you can't just protect the target, which if she can get to, she's going to be able to do us harm, so long as she can get a certain moderate amount of equipment and a certain moderate amount of associates. In other words, it sounds too easy. And what worries me most is, uh, the long-range weapon, the anti-tank missile, uh, that you could shoot from practically anywhere. It, again, it's, uh, it's the murder of Jack Kennedy. You can shoot from practically anywhere and commit a terrorist act at a great distance. No, and as you get a greater distance from the target, you get many more uh, you get many more people who have to be watched. In other words, it's the square of the, of the distance. Many more people who have to be watched. We're running a little over time, but thank you very much.